Welcome to another episode of Artsy AF. Thanks for being here. In this episode, we talk to our friends and fellow artists, uh, Morgan Mandala and Randall Roberts. We recorded this podcast on the legendary 420. 420. 420. 420. <laughs> we decided to uh, record in a... Uh, what cele- celebratory state is yeah we celebrated the holiday uh-huh and we did it in their backyard as well so there's a few um uh, pleasant bird noises you might get a tiny bit of ambience but it'll sound really good we promise they've got a uh, they've got a class coming up at the chapel of sacred mirrors soon right yeah so randall and morgan are hosting the artist prayer workshop at Chapel of Sacred Mirrors in New York on August 8th through the 10th. I actually took this art workshop a few years ago. It was the first time I ever took an art workshop and the first time I ever met artists and it was revolutionary in my life. So you recommend it? Yes, (laughs) wholeheartedly. Uh, Everything changed after that class. Nice. Uh, Not only do they teach you art, um, I think almost more importantly, they they teach love. It's a beautiful, beautiful place to go. And if you're scared or you've been on the fence about going, go ahead and go to cosm.org. That's C-O-S-M dot org. And go ahead and sign up and change your life. That's right, folks. In this podcast, there are a lot of references, a lot of uh, maybe obscure references even. We have a lot of notes on our website. Yeah, if you go to rcafpodcast.com, you can find tons of notes and links. Uh, for references to follow along with in this podcast. And you can also check out uh, Randall and Morgan's solo works and collaborative works that they've done together. So get on over there if you want to dive really deep into what the fuck we're talking about. (laughs) (laughs) And so now we're just going to go ahead and dive right in to another episode. In fact, a special 420, 420, 420, 420 episode of Artsy AF. You're being held here against your will. <laughs> so, hey Randall. Hey, how how are how are you how are you doing? <laughs> are you doing so great, are you man. so blazed? Yeah, it's 420. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Got real. Yeah. A really nice day on those electric bikes. Yeah. And, yeah, it was uh, nice. E-bikes. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, we got, uh, you know, blazed. Dude, we topped out at 30, son, going down the hills. Damn. More yeah. like, that one was 40. Something like that. It was fast. I got speed wobbles. I should have looked at that. Yeah. Should have looked at the speedometer. <laughs> so, Randall Roberts and Morgan Mandala are um, <laughs> wonderful live painters. They're international. Performance painters. We're internationally recognized. Oh, cool. Uh, Australia, Hungary. Yeah. Wait, you guys are going to you guys are going to England when? June, June. Uh, around the first week of June till mid June for uh, Anthropos Festival. We're very excited about that. So you said like the style of festivals that happen out here, they're trying to recreate what's happening here out there. Yeah, that's my understanding. Is that the organizers are fond of the base coast festival scene that we find ourselves a part of and yeah they're they're gonna do a base coast doof (laughs) (laughs) and they've been kind enough to invite us and uh some other performers that are associated with the scene (laughs) who are any other painters going out there do you know there are a bunch of painters who are going to be there. A lot of them are European. There's a a, a, a graphite artist who does those like cascading faces. Miles. That go, Miles. Oh, uh, he's going to be there. Uh, jo- Miles uh, Art. Miles. Miles he Art. He goes by Miles yeah, Art. Yeah, Miles Instagram. Art is he's his amazing, Instagram. Yeah. yeah, he's great. And we're really excited to meet him. Yeah, he's going to be there. Sweet. Is he? Is, is he from England? I think so. Yeah, somewhere in there. Cool. <laughs> um, our friend uh, Jack Lightfoot the will be there. He's a he's a really cool guy. Taurus Energy. Yeah, Taurus. He's yeah. a sweetheart. Yeah, and uh, a talented painter. So you guys have been doing <laughs> this for a while. Um, I don't know. Usually we will go through the the rote uh, 
question asking part, I guess, to uh, grease the wheels a little bit. What got you into painting? Tell us your life story. <laughs> like, why do we do this thing that like, I mean, we stack, sacrifice financial stability and any semblance of a normal life. I mean, I do. I know you guys kind of, you definitely do too. Uh, so, I mean, I guess this question comes up a lot. It's like, why do we do this? I don't know. I've thought about it. I used to think about it more. Uh, and now I'm just doing it. Yeah. Your life uh, is kind of like a, a pyramid of potential with this huge base when you're young. And then all the things happen to you in your life. Yeah. Uh, and you go up to the pyramid until you're at the present moment, which is the peak. And in, the way, in that way, there's kind of no choice to be. Right where you are so yeah i think my the marble i had fell down the <laughs> the face of the of, of the cliff there and, and bounced here and bounced there until i just um now i have i can say the lofty like oh i had no choice but to be an artist but yeah i don't think uh i don't know i always like to draw and then when i had a, a kind of a awakening of of sorts when i was 30 uh, it was in tandem for me with like choosing to live my own life and right like for instance i i worked at uh, ibm for a long time and i maybe drew some pictures as a hobby but i'm, I'm mostly for a, uh, a creative expression i was like playing video games and not really yeah. and then all of a sudden I, I just i don't know i life uh opened up and i uh I quit my job and drove across the country for a year and went to all these. Was there like a specific catalyst that got you to like make that switch? Uh, t yeah, two things in tandem. I met Alex and Allison Gray and specifically all the people that hung out with them who I spent a lot of time with. Um, gosh, the, the great John Lloyd, uh, he's a brilliant artist and sacred geometrist <laughs> or whatever. Uh, and Oliver Vernon was was hanging around back then. These guys were all working artists, and 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 then um, my girlfriend and I broke up uh, in a pretty dramatic way. And I just uh, I was like, you know what? Fuck all this. I'm gonna go make art. And yeah. and I was so lucky that it it worked out. You know, here I am, 16 years later, talking to us in your backyard. <laughs> yeah, on 420. Yeah. yeah dude. We're so baked. Yeah, we're, <laughs> we're fucking so baked, bro. Four twenty. Um, yeah, and I don't know that. That's my nutshell story. But Morgan, I think I always just did art by nature. Always drew and always was drawing all over everything in my notes, and that's how I learned and um, thought of things. And so I developed the ability I guess more than most people would just because of my own interest being by myself as a kid drawing and then I were you encouraged to do it when you were a kid I was by yeah like my parents were like oh that's great you know and they they encouraged kind of everything they we were in mm -hmm. as much as they could put us in they tried to expose us to a lot and I had art teachers who were like oh you're special and Mm -hmm. They'd give me extra things like all the extra clay from class or all the like materials and I gravitated towards that at the end of high school kind of helped me through rougher times. It was like the one thing I still had that I could use for expression and enjoyment that could zone me out for hours at a time mm -hmm. and then it came to the decision I thought I was going to have to you know get a real job. Yeah. Go to college. And when I got to college, I first entered to do like large animal veterinary medicine. Horses. And quickly horses, horses cows. and cows and zoo animals. Or oh, so, like, like giraffes. Like elephants and shit. Yeah. Wow. Zebras. Um, it really kind of covers all, like a large animal vet is what if I was going to be a vet. And then I was like, oh, I don't want to do euthanization and spend Ooh. so much time with chemi chemistry and like yeah. work as much as a doctor, but get paid half as much. And, Ooh. um, I love animals, but I was like, that's not what I want to do. And then just kind of fell into doing art in school. Cause I was like, that's a thing, you know? Mm -hmm. Okay. Why not? And I ended up doing that in school and then started live painting. Cause I had a lot of friends who were musicians and in bands and they asked me and, 
2008, I probably started to come live paint with our band on stage, the local venue. And I was like, okay, that sounds fun. And started doing that and kind of, then it became a thing. Then yeah. it yeah, just blew up. It's so interesting how you guys both got into live painting before it was a thing. Maybe. <laughs> uh, I think people have been live painting forever. Yeah. But um, in our very small niche, yeah, uh, mm-hmm. it's it's pretty popular. It seems like the number of live painters at any event. I mean, there's like live painters at weddings now. You can hire one to like paint the wedding. Oh, really? Uh, it's somewhat common. Like paint so, the venue or something? Yeah, like and I think that's only in the last like four years. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was kind of pushed by my, my good friend Ohia to go live paint. But he was like, he would like make me do it. Yeah. In the beginning. He's like, oh, you got to go do it. Uh, the grays would be doing something, and I, I wouldn't even have considered it. Yeah. You know, this is like 2004. Yeah. 2005. Wow. Because art's such like a intimate, private thing that you do by yourself, and that transition to like doing it in front of people, it's yeah. scary at first. It's. I want to say, uh, we were talking about this last night, but the shout out to... Uh, you know, Anthony and the boys, uh, Papadocio and the Rootwire Festival from 2012, I think was, you know, being interested in this kind of art and this kind of psychedelic movement, whatever you want to call that, or, you know, just our generation and, and community. Um, that was the first time you got to see, like, all the, you know, hula hoops and the lights and, and then and then rows of, of professionally lit live painters on, on these, you know. Small platform. Yeah, these risers. And yeah. uh, I, it was all for that photo, you know, the whole, it was the first time in America, I think any, anyone had seen anything like that, yeah. as far as I know. Seeing yeah. photographs from that event specifically pushed me to start painting. Really? Yeah. I was doodling and Dude. I remember seeing pictures of that and it just looked so cool. It was a good one, man. Yeah. Yeah. It, I feel spe- it's our like little Woodstock, you know. Yeah, Rootwire was with the first or second one, whatever it was, was. Wow, uh, it was really a cool little time. Yeah, it was magic because they brought all these painters together who had never really met, you know. Mm-hmm. And then we realized, wow, it's like we're all doing the same thing, and it's kind of like a, kind of like a meeting of the minds sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah, it was happening like in little areas, I think. Like there were the Colorado kind of crew of eight live painters and there's California larger crews in different cities and then Papadozio spent time touring and picked their favorites and invited them all to Rootwire and for some reason we all showed up to the middle of Ohio. <laughs> yeah. Because they took care of us it was and great. we wanted to see what it was about. Neutral ground. Yeah. They also they treated the live painters like musicians, so they gave us all these shiny VIP lanyards mm-hmm. and and uh we had, you know, meals and access to the green room and I, it was really Well, I think they realized yeah, you know. yeah, like these a lot of them were our friends, uh, Papadocio is some of the friendliest people I know, and they saw that the live painters they knew or the painters, the artists, are working their asses off. You know, they're at a festival when mm-hmm. we used to just do it for a ticket. You're working like 12-plus you know, hours a day sometimes, and you are lugging stuff around, trying yep. to sell things, damaging your products or your painting by being it, you know, subject to sun and dirt and wind. and Right. It's a lot of work, and I think... They realize that for that's cool first. Wait, so that was 2012, and that was the or, first time what? where like it was really dialed yeah. in, like yeah. legitimately. You two weren't painting together yet at that time, were you? No, we, we met there. I think we, yeah, 2000. Oh wow, that's also where I met both of them. Oh, wow, very special, very special Sash. place. <laughs> that's when I lived in Kentucky, and Morgan was talking about all the crews, you know, from different areas, and I was like the one guy. <laughs> in Kentucky doing it at the time and I was like real nervous to uh like I think someone was giving a workshop it may have even been Randall but we were all sitting around and I I was like nervous to meet uh like like Morgan and and other people uh, but my my buddy Martin uh had told me to say some sort of inside joke to Randall when I met him because oh, yeah. cause, like Randall and I hadn't met yet, but Martin and I already had. And he was like, say this thing to Randall. And (laughs) I met Randall like on the second day and my voice was just completely gone. And I was like, Martin says to say. 
<laughs> and he cracked up and uh yeah it was cool we were we we hit it off and uh yeah i mean seriously though shout out to papadozio yeah jeez and, and to the artist martin cash he's a yeah. mutual friend of ours yeah yeah martin and i worked together for years at the omega institute while we were mm-hmm. building our body of paintings yeah yeah i think um while we're on the topic i think a lot of festivals can take a or could take a page from Papadozio and Rootwire's book and and treat artists, live painters, that is a little little bit better. And um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, what do you guys think about all that? Um, where where do your opinions lie? I don't really have to ask this question, but I just kind of want to get into that whole dynamic. Well, I think that's interesting to like because now there's so many people who want to share and live paint and. There's a huge range in um, experience. I really love how at festivals, like especially Sonic Bloom, really I think live painting started pretty big there. Even in like 2008, 9, they had a little gallery and painters and it was kind of going on. But they always kind of, we made sure, and the same things happens at Arise or other festivals, that everyone kind of has extension cords and you daisy chain for the people who show up with their easel and they just really want to live paint. Mm -hmm. But the great thing, like Rootwire had risers for the painters that they hired. Mm -hmm. And they're like, okay, these are the ones we're choosing. Or a lot of people have submissions, you know, and you can decide if you want to go for money or not go for money or or what. But I think having kind of a tiered system where, yes, we'll let people kind of daisy chain and be a part of it, like live paint. Mm -hmm. But there should be... You know, yeah. kind of depending on experience, like, like packages. Something you to get. work for. Like yeah. you, you're painting on the floor and you're like, man, I want to crush painting so yeah. like one day I could paint up there or something, you know? Yeah, like it's something. like headlining DJs compared to people who are opening or playing whatever set. It's what like... If you're, an, if you're a dancer, you know, and you get your shit together and learn aerial acrobatic, you know, routines on, on these awesome, you know, hoops hanging from the ceiling then yeah, you should be paid and, and go do your thing, you know, if you practice that much. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, there's also nothing wrong at all with bringing your canvas or a Frisbee or whatever down to the yeah. <laughs> celebrate to the however, music. However you choose to celebrate. But I, th- I think I see yeah. what you're saying. Like the lines are a little blurry mm-hmm. for like what we're doing. We're sort of like, you know, are they just out there with a hula hoop, like doing their thing? Or are they a uh, working artist with a huge Instagram following and, and you know, surviving on print sales and, <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, I don't know. Uh, maybe hopefully the quality of the work and the and the staging at these things. That's cool. Like you guys specifically have <clears throat> developed the thing where you're like true performance painters. I had n- known you guys for a while and I knew your artwork, but then I went and saw you guys paint on stage at Spongle. I was like, oh, God damn. Like this is a... This is legit, it's a you know. Thing. Yeah, it's like truly entertaining. Yeah, we we don't always talk about everything, but certain things when it's like a one night on stage, mm-hmm. something needs to happen. Gig, we kind of like have somewhat of a plan, and think about set times and who's playing and when to do kind of the reveal brush strokes, so you can finally tell what it is and then yeah. watch it change. We try to think about that, and that's why it's just a totally different awesome experience that i never thought i would have as a painter as yeah. an artist mm-hmm. yeah it's the performance aspect of it yeah it's like give people something to yeah talk about and and turn their attention to like how long have you guys been painting together live since 2013 so you like kind of over time figured out a way to make it more more well, like a deliberate performance but still like being well, in the we were chaos so honored to be on stage with our favorite music, Spangle, that we were like, okay, if we're ever going to plan something out, uh, we should do it for this show because mm-hmm. it was really special. Well, and we were trying to think about, like, if you're watching a live painter from the back of the crowd, like, that far away, like, how can we make it so you can see mm-hmm. from the farthest part of this auditorium yeah and kind of know what it is and even the closest people are you know 50 feet away or something when you count the stage and the barrier around it so yeah we wanted to like make it pop and and have it be fun for everyone to watch as they like stare at the stage and simon's awesome about that too he's like 
gets that like it's hard to be just one person up there for a whole show and everyone's just got their attention geared toward you and it's nice to have other things to look at like performers and painters and just has a more whole vibe to it yeah when we painted with him in australia we were kind of nervous and we're back and he's like we were like where do you want us to go and he goes in the front <laughs> you know, just get, get in front of me I anyone to look at me how's the balance between especially you know you, like you guys are known for live painting and you get paid to go out to gigs and stuff and you do it quite a bit uh, like what's the balance between live painting and then like studio work and like it depends on the situation, like in the length of the live painting session. So if it's like a one night thing like that, where we're doing a huge one night painting, mm -hmm. we'll either take it to some smaller gigs that aren't a big deal or work on it in the studio to try and get it finished. Yeah. Other ones like festivals that are long enough and are like kind of survivable enough to be able to paint all day, mm -hmm. we'll pretty much be finished and might work on it a little bit in the studio. And then I also... I have personally studio pieces that I don't really take out very much that are a little more like refined or that I don't really want the full energy blast. But I do find that it is sometimes helpful to like get you out of a rut to like take your painting out live and be forced to work through whatever mm -hmm. knot you're in. We typically will start like if we do a festival, we'll do a new painting every time. Mm -hmm. Try to finish. Uh, for, for some reason, the ones not the physically big but like the big idea paintings you're like your bangers that if you will like stay in the studio and are born there right a lot of the live painting but really it's influenced by artists like the further collective and our friend seth mcmahon like the flow kung fu throwdown uh in you know a niche within a niche within right. this small niche already right. already there's the this kind of you know uh break dancing performances or mm -hmm. it, it's flow kung fu it's like who yeah. can throw paint and go crazy and then make that shit look dope by yeah, the end yeah, of the yeah. weekend like our live paintings are like for our painter friends yeah, yeah. You know, it's like uh, it's like jazz almost. It's like improvisation. Yeah. I always think of things you can't think up necessarily while you're just sitting there looking at a blank canvas. You kind of just like automatically let your hand guide you, maybe to the rhythm of the music, or maybe just to whatever you're feeling in that moment. <laughs> <laughs> I know it sounds corny, but it yeah. It, I I mean, yeah. So I guess with that dichotomy. Um, and we got a dog chiming in a little bit too. Um, 420 dog. Boulder on uh, So, <laughs> is there a, do you guys have a preferred way to <laughs> paint? <laughs> what do you it, mean? Do you like, like flowing better or do you like, and, it, or, and what's the, they, uh, each other. they right, do. Yeah. They like inform each other. I think, I can't say which one I like more. One is more relaxed than the other, but one sometimes is more ultimately satisfying you learn more when you're flowing and you don't know and a lot of studio pieces will have like places where we don't know what's going to happen and just have like a a frame for kind of what's going on in the painting i get frustrated or feel like i'm painting myself into a corner when i decide too much of what the finished painting is going to look like yeah mm -hmm. yeah i do yeah. too I forgot what I was going to say. Dude, 420. Uh, 420. Dude. 420. <laughs> Blaze it, bro. Blaze it. Um, no, that's it. That's what I was going to talk about is uh, I, I rarely plan out my paintings. And I don't know if that's a detriment or a help to me. But I think for me, at least, the magic doesn't really come about unless... I'm just staring at the canvas and have that idea r right in that moment. Sometimes I'll like, I'll gradient a little bit and be like, okay, I want this to be dark purple to blue to red or something like that. But um, yeah, I, d I don't know what it is, but I'm real attracted to that in the moment kind of. Uh, and you don't have to come up with an idea for a live painting. That's really <laughs> yeah. what we're doing. Maybe I'm just lazy. Live painting so much. <laughs> it's not even lazy. It's just like if you're trying to think of a hard-edged idea that many times in a row, especially if you're doing shows on, the, on weekends, and, and some ideas obviously are better than others. You know, that's yeah. why minis are great, like trying things out. Yeah, yeah just experimenting. But, yeah, and sometimes you yeah. might land on something that 
you're not that into, but you're painting it. And that's yeah. why I like the flow pieces as well. Mm. It's like you can find new things that you didn't know you were into. Right. And then it, it fuels you. Being creative, like it's all the flow. And it, it's just different ways of exploring and expressing it, you know? Yeah. Like I typically come up with an idea, but it's cultivated out of finding present moments and insight. And then you, and then you carry that along with you onto the canvas. So it's like totally. we're doing the same thing. But just at different in, in a stages. different way. Yeah, 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 different points. When you're making art all the time, it, it is hard to come up with ideas sometimes. Like sometimes you just don't really have ideas. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like, do you ever have that where you just like, there's oh, no, totally. There's God no in love. In I mean, yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> it's like, it, those are the two best <laughs> ideas. Yeah. Also, I think, I think all of us may agree that you like paint best when you're not thinking very much and right. you are in that like total yeah. flow state no matter what you're working on. I, I get real excited for for my own pleasure, I guess, or for my own interest is when I watch the painting unfold and take on this meaning that it didn't have four or five sessions ago, you know? And I'm like, oh, okay, this is what this means. And now I'm in this uh, sort of like, self-made narrative you know and uh yeah that's a cool process yeah, yeah. i mean we're all kind of layman neuroscientists yeah w artists 420 420 plays it <laughs> <laughs> like <laughs> i was thinking the other day like about sketchbooks right like like i've kept a sketchbook going i mean pretty much my whole life uh and i've gotten really into them and then you know you kind of phase out for a few months and go back in but especially in a town where you're like taking the train a lot uh sure you know that kind of thing like sketchbooks so then they become these kind of you know, like, like a really positive tool for life that if you don't identify with your, with yourself as an artist you miss out on this like amazing tool this book where sure. you like you're writing down the sketchbook is is cooler than the journal or the diary in a way because um you it's just a shed to put all your stuff in, yeah, so you yeah. can do it all. And, and and but you're also on a regular basis writing down like stuff on how to improve your life and how to improve yourself. Yeah. And it struck me the other day that like, oh man, artists really have this like little leg up on on the, just the average you know person who I was even like you know 20 sure. years ago. I'm like, wait, what, like would I? You know, you, you like leave a dinner party and you're like, oh, I was an asshole. I got to start being a better person, you know, and, and these are, those are good thoughts to have. Right. Yeah. And if you're not uh, regularly, yeah, self-assessing and writing, writing down the ideas for your, your best self in this sketchbook, which is this kind of thing that, you know, just comes with the territory. Um, I don't know. I don't, I, I wonder, it's how, it's how we work on ourselves. Right. Our yeah. There's a certain magic exactly. about having a feeling and then putting pen to paper uh, like get, getting it out of you yeah. onto this page and like documenting this space, this like insight or idea that you're working with. Yeah. Otherwise, if you just hold it in there, it's just going to swirl around and it's going to affect your behavior in like strange or negative ways. Right. Well, think about the power of like if you go to IHOP and like you just doodle the ketchup bottle that's mm -hmm. on the table and then you close your book and you have your breakfast and then all the times you've gone to a place like that and didn't draw the... That drawing of the ketchup bottle says someone was here. They were present, you yeah. know. Mm -hmm. um, it's almost like you took, you know, I meditated for three minutes at, at IHOP. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, yeah, I have to think that that long term is uh, like taking a vitamin supplement for your, your soul, yeah. mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, I love sketchbooks, you know. And then, so what I was going to say is uh, when you're painting mm -hmm. and sort of like embracing the random and then you're like solving these problems, you yeah, splash yeah. purple next to yellow, what am I going to yeah, do? Yeah. And then you solve it. Uh, again, I wonder if that has a positive long-term net effect I on the there's artist. A, there's yeah. a positive psychological effect for sure. I've, yeah. I've also noticed like my, my, um, my art at large, like finished pieces, like paintings, there's so much better whenever I'm regularly in my sketchbook and experimenting with ideas and getting loose. It helps you like loosen up and be more sure. open to how the paint wants to go on the canvas instead of like, you can get really n like closed, narrow minded if you don't uh, spend a lot of time in your sketchbook. Like I bounce between the two a lot. Mm -hmm. and, uh, For me, I had, I had such a problem 
because I'm kind of the opposite. I, I'm so loose on the canvas sometimes that like back in the day, I guess, that a part of the canvas up in the upper left corner would be so intriguing to me that I would just like render it out and solve all the problems for that. Meanwhile, the middle is just like, you know, kind of cool or whatever. <laughs> it's like distracting from the eye. So like when I do get into the sketchbook, I kind of, it, it kind of um, brought me this clarity about composition and where the eye wants to move mm -hmm. and how thick a line, like line weight, you know, things like that. Just simple, basic things. That's how the sketchbook has uh, benefited my life. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Get a sketchbook yeah. and draw That's a pretty it. cool story, huh? Hi, I'm, I'm Randall and I'm a sketchbook user. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hi, Randall. It's a safe place. This is a safe place, Randall. Yeah, it's, to 420. It's blazing. Oh, bro. Did we mention that it's 420, 2020? <laughs> oh. Boulder, Colorado. <laughs> 420, 20. Where it's sunny 300 days a year. Oh, don't I know it. <laughs> <laughs> so how about, uh, what about the subject of like, you know, making a living as an artist? You guys have both full-time artists you guys are doing it yes and, sir and you've, and you've uh nudged a lot of people to do that too yeah yeah i, <laughs> I wish we had it no i'm just decide they're like oh you can do it well, and i can <laughs> yeah. do it that's how i feel too like one look at my art and uh, you're like i can do it uh, <laughs> like i have i have younger painters sometimes come up to me and be like man you, you're the reason i started art and i don't know if that's a compliment or if I'm like, if I should be like, yeah, yeah, totally. I, I mean, I can do it obviously like anyone can. <laughs> yeah. It's like that there's a Radiohead song that's anyone can play guitar, you know, you know that song yeah. from back in the day. Yeah. And sometimes I feel like that. Um, anyone can paint or anyone can um, learn how to cook really well. Uh, anyone can be creative. Yeah. In our, uh, workshops and things but the, we push the the idea that painting is a peaceful practice and look if you want to be a, a if you're working on yourself and you want to be a kind person let your self-criticism and your skill level even right let that stay at the front door and work on art you know there there's it, it helps if you're in prison to work on art it it it, it, it helps you I don't any know. kind of prison yeah, this this literal this this metaphorical prison that we're in. Um, art's a peaceful practice. You can't be hitting or robbing anyone when you're trying to work on a canvas. So, right. if you just <laughs> want to draw the line there and be like, I want to be just a nice enough person, then you can embrace art. It's one of the you know, one of the great uh, human activities. I was going to say also that you know, as far as making art. Uh, full time and being a full time artist, a lot of people come and they're like, "Yeah, I want to do this. I want to be mm. an artist." And then they're going to get to this like platform where everything's cool and they're making a bunch of money. It's like this yeah, illusion that people have. <laughs> it's that, not. Yeah, it's not yeah, as it's, glamorous as it may seem. Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. <laughs> like keep your day job and work on art if you like art. Like, yeah. like even go part time if you want to really try to like start to see how it feels to try and make a living on your art it's like full-time hustle and mm. you don't always know where money's going to come from and sometimes it's great and sometimes like you do work for yourself you have to run a business all yeah. on all sides yeah but mm -hmm. it's amazing you know you can do amazing things and go to galleries all over the world or like have these experiences that are wonderful but it definitely isn't something you should just like Randall amazingly quit his job and became an artist, but that's a beautiful, it's a, miraculous anomalous, tale, and yeah. I don't think that's everyone's path or should be. Yeah, well, it's fun to discover the, your ability to, like, survive. And during my kind of epiphany t period there, I was like, oh, I could just wash dishes on a cruise ship if I want to and yeah, and turn into the Big Lebowski and just, like, everything's going to be okay. Right. You know, yeah. like, <laughs> this is my life, you know? Yeah. Um, I think that Morgan and I, we also felt so strongly about other, not just art, but um, about this, the, you know, the psychedelic movement that we've been lucky to be born into here. Yeah. 
Um, I feel really strongly about that. I feel I identify with the counterculture. <sighs> and, um, the, you know, these things all overlap when you're like, okay, I just, I'm just barely smart enough and savvy <laughs> enough that I, I can't live with myself if I go get a, a day job. Yeah. I Sweet. have to give this a go. And, and so th then you become a professional artist. And then there's all the... And that's all the hero's the, journey right there, yeah, right? I mean... There, 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 but there's a lot of way stations yeah. into surviving yeah. on yeah. art. I mean, a lot of people <laughs> um, around here like dabble in the weed industry or do other side jobs. 420. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sunburn. <laughs> um, yeah, I think there's like different ways to do it but there's no carved out path like there is for becoming an mm -hmm. accountant or right working in right you know some sort of real estate firm it's like a pretty you have to cut your own path and, right. and make it work in your own way and but that's what's beautiful about it too to what you were saying earlier about um maybe this misconception that like uh before i really really went 100 into the art you know uh i thought oh I just need to be creative and everything will work out. But we eat so much shit. I think any creative person does. You know, there's so many denials uh, to festivals or so many uh, times where you feel overlooked. And now that uh, Instagram and, and Facebook are so popular and just in everyone's lives, it's easy to get in there and like look and scroll and be like, oh man, it's just another level of, of being like that guy's life is better than mine because he's creating. But now it's like, Oh, that girl's life is better than mine because she's killing it and has a gallery on, you know, in Venice beach or something. And like, what an easy life she must, her life must be so stable. But I think that there's something about creativity and, and living your life that until you eat a certain amount of shit, like you don't get the glory. Well, and it's like a continuation of creativity. Like when things don't work out the way you thought. Yeah. You, you creatively solve problems and yeah. figure out who you are person, like through your own personal lens and space and times. And you find a creative way to continue on and keep doing your damn thing. Yeah. It yeah. also helps if you're going to be a public person, you know, g receiving donation basically from strangers mm -hmm. to do your thing. To be like relentlessly positive and optimistic, yeah, and to pr solve problems, and that's kind of, yeah, the, the the hidden monkey on your back to being an artist is, um, I guess, some people get away with sharing, staring at their shoes and 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 being grumpy I don't think anymore. But but I think yeah, especially with the you know the advent of Instagram and 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 that mm -hmm. kind of thing, um, you really got to love it. I think. Yeah, it picks you out of bed. It picks you up out of bed some days when you're not into it. You're like, oh, that's right. I'm this optimistic yeah. problem solver. I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll take another whack at it. And, yeah. and, and, you know, um, remember your training, kind of thing. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, I was gonna say, you know, if you're looking at Dan Blazarian or whatever, <laughs> and you're like, oh, I don't have, but yeah, number one, it's not what you think. And what was that? Uh, oh, comparison is the thief of joy. Yeah. Yeah, so it's certainly. important to remember. Just like worries the misuse of imagination. Any yeah. artist listening to this, your your job is to get your butt in the chair and paint today. And uh, we have to tell ourselves that every day. That and that, if you do that, you can put your stamp on the day, and then you're living a righteous life. You know, that's yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, and then you know, money, money, money's this weird thing. You know, mm -hmm. it'll come and go. It, wh whether you're I don't know. Uh, it doesn't matter when you're in the chair. Right. One, one way or the other. Right. It doesn't matter. So so get your butt in the chair. Advice to live by. <laughs> For 20, 20, 20, 20, 20. <laughs> But seriously, there's, there's something about just getting up every day and just showing up to your creative space, whatever it is, whether it's music or um, writing. You know, there's a reason why Isaac Asimov was uh, one of the best wa writers, you know, of the last 50 years or so. It's, he woke up, you know, kind of early in the morning and just wrote until noon. Mm -hmm. Didn't matter if it was good, quote unquote, mm -hmm. or whatever. And then out of that, you can kind of pull 
you know, what you're really trying to say. In our case, it's a sketchbook, you know, how, for how, however long. And out of that, you can pick the gems and the ideas that sort of have uh, prescience. Is that a word? Precedence. I don't know. Precedence. Sure. Is the it, ones that, that, like, you go back to and you're like, oh, yeah, that was, that was yeah. pretty good. That's, that's pretty good. It's crazy, like, the, the make art every day thing. It's, it's more of a challenge than you would think. Mm-hmm. to make art every day like it's it's taken me years to actually get to the point where i make art every day yeah. but it, it's like something randall i remember like y- you would say it all the time make art every day and i tell anybody else that comes up to me and like digs what i'm doing and wants advice you just say make art every day mm-hmm. but it, it's like a real challenge you know but i think it's a cool aim mm-hmm. yeah it's also the kind of like boiled down you know, quick high five version of living a righteous life. Yeah. I like, again, I think in tandem with, if not preceding the art stuff is the desire to see the world of man, um, be healed and to contribute to the, the good team, uh, and to be good yourself. Then you create this whole life where you're making art and then, yeah, you, you, uh, you say to a passerby, make art every day because that's the distilled idea. You know, like mm-hmm. that, that if you tell somebody that and they go do it, I mean, um, they're also going to compost and, yeah. <laughs> uh, you, you know, yeah, use so many you, factors that play into making art every use day. Use low impact, long life light bulbs and yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. get an electric <laughs> bike and, you know, that because it all comes with, um, yeah, striving for this somewhat arbitrary goal. I don't think art's arbitrary, but um, make art every day is 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 kind of like saying, be peaceful. Yeah, go and be peaceful. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Your your painting should should look dope. <laughs> <laughs> but really, uh, having the wherewithal, you know, it helps to look at other dope shit. Absolutely. A lot. You know, frequently. We, Morgan and I look at. Look for new artists every day. Uh, we try to find one or two every day. Like, oh, I'll check this guy out. Mm-hmm. Check this girl out. Just so you're filling your head up with dopeness. <laughs> and so that you can look uh, objectively in that kind of crucial second half of making right. a painting and go, okay, but does it look dope? Will right. Will anybody on the street walk by and go, Be hey, like, Whoa, cool. that looks cool. Yeah, you know, yeah. That, that's that last little bit to put on the painting. Well, and I think it helps with figuring out what you consider dope. <laughs> like, what yeah, is, because what's dope to you in a painting? Yeah, like, like dope, dude. you know, when you look at a Snoop painting, you're dog. like, oh, this was awesome. Well, why? And how can you, like, absorb that or take it into consideration when you're working on your work? Do you like how it feels like there's a ton of distance? Do you like this one hard edge? Do you like a certain, <laughs> certain shape or whatever it is? I don't know, color palette? Yeah. Always hard edges. You know? Yeah, hard edges. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Blair, our producer over here, had a good question. Um, do you guys have uh, like daily practices or rituals? You know, yeah. what's your what's your day to day? Like, what? How do you get it going? I like to hike in the mornings before I do anything, and mm-hmm. then smoothie, and then work. Yeah. For the rest of the day, and I used to like kind of set the space a little bit more. Um, sometimes we still do like. We might do, you know, shipments and all that emails and stuff in the morning and then kind of clean and and like, yeah, light incense or light Palo Santo or something. And then they'll be like, OK, it's painting time. Yeah. John, um, can we talk about your routine a little bit? Oh, because you're I mean, and not to put you on the spot. You're a beast. I love you. <laughs> you're the most regimented artist, I think, that I know personally. I can't think of another one. And I honestly i am inspired by you because I've started. I've started my mornings off recently, most mornings. Uh, I'm just a fiend for inconsistency, but mm-hmm. most mornings I go and uh, and I run for a mile or a half mile. And that's, you know, maybe some runners will be like, no, nah, that's not a lot. Uh, it's a lot for me, okay? <laughs> yeah. But I, I just want to, like, I just maybe just give us a little flex about, you know, like what you do every day. Okay. <laughs> so I'll wake up at like 7. And then seven AM <laughs> And then you look look you look out the window at sunlight until your eyes open fully. 
Yeah. You drink a glass of water and then I'll make coffee with butter and MCT oil. <laughs> and then I'll answer emails. That slow release of caffeine, you know yeah. what I'm saying? So I drink that and then I answer my emails and get all that stuff in order. And I'll take a shower and then I'll sit down and I'll meditate. And then after that, I'll either fulfill orders or paint for a couple hours. And then I'll go for a run. So I'll come home and I'll paint for a couple hours. Oh. After, my, after my run, I'll paint for a few more hours. And then I'll do like a weightlifting workout, like kettlebells or like body weight stuff or like pull-ups. And then eat dinner and then paint till I go sleep. That's kind of what I do every single day, pretty much. There's always like, but there's always like room for variation too. Yeah. But there's like certain really, like the most important ones I think is uh, meditating and getting some sort of um, intense workout in. Yeah. It just personally for me helps me um, just be like uh, less anxious and chiller i think it's good to get some <laughs> physical activity and if you're going to be sitting around painting all day yeah mm -hmm. can get old randall so yeah what do you do routine oh gosh uh i would love to be training for the navy seals like you guys <laughs> <laughs> but uh my my honest routine i don't know there's the ideal day that morgan said you know wake up exercise and paint um but when I look back on my life, I, I've always enjoyed nicotine and ca and coffee in the morning. Sure. I come from a blue collar, you know, kind of community where it was like, you stop at Dunkin' Donuts, get your coffee, go to work. You know, I, I worked in a warehouse for a long time when I was yeah. a young young person. So that kind of like, you know, the warehouse guys like smoking cigs oh, yeah. and having coffee like before you start your day. Um, has stuck with me my whole life. I kind of I like being like a wizard. I go on the front porch, and, and now I, I don't smoke cigarettes anymore. I smoke the the Jewel alternative, and uh, you know you have all feel the, better. Yeah, but you, you, it still uh, does the same thing. Where you, I feel like this kind of wizard. Uh, I've always thought <laughs> yeah. that where you got your steaming coffee, yeah. and then you're bellowing out, you know, oh, yeah. smoke, you're, and you're like casting your spell. Your for the state day. Like, changing matter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, yeah. So the first, yeah. the first, the first hour of the day is is coffee and and uh, just landing back after some sleep, and then uh, yeah, we um, we we do enjoy a trip to the post office. There's a beautiful walk from our house here. <laughs> oh, it's perfect down to in Boulder, and so um, a typical day will will involve that. I'll pack my prints for my orders online that day, and then I have a leisurely walk. Maybe grab a bagel, and then come home and Some it's time locks. to paint. Yeah, but um, that's kind of my old man exercise. Is the yeah, is yeah. the mile uh, round trip to the light, to the post office? I, I ride a bike quite a bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm taking care of myself. Yeah. But um, there's something about the uh, routine as ritual you know yeah it's something like you can't just be in front of the canvas all the time you've got to uh you've got to kind of break up the monotony and and having uh, an idea i've been infatuated with lately is like making time in your day uh where you're bored and and i don't <laughs> mean like you're boring or you're like what do i do but you just like you kind of clear your mind, whether it's a run or, or weightlifting or nicotine or coffee on the porch or a hike. You're just, you're not necessarily, your bandwidth isn't taken up by, oh man, I've got to create this thing and it's, it's got to be done by this time. It's like you're allowing that space for, for things to come in and, and flow. If you're like working on a, on a long-term piece though, I've noticed that you can kind of like divide you, can, you or you can triage like, where's my mind right now? Am I fucking pooped? And, uh, maybe this is a good time to put that glaze of varnish on that other piece. Yeah, so yeah. you can just, you know, 20 minutes of just zone out. You don't have to pay attention to what you're doing, mm -hmm. but if you're super coffeeed up and it's like 11 in the morning and, and you're <laughs> yeah. jazzed on the thing you're working on, and uh, maybe you're really enjoying the, even the section of music you're listening to right now, and like then like go in for that master stroke and that one special part of the painting you've been thinking about, you know, yeah. mm -hmm. get in there and, and detail. And I, I kind of assign, depending, I kind of assess and assign. You know, it's yeah, like, yeah. are we are we in medium mode here? I guess I'll just block in some colors because I'm I'm not there yet. Oh, I was also going to say, as far as routines go. Um, 
we do have meetings in a calendar that oh. we set. So Ooh. that's one thing that's a game changer. Huge. So we have meetings with each other every Tuesday and Thursday in the morning and write stuff on the calendar. We take our lists of all the things we have to do, all these people we have to answer, just whatever, galleries we have to hang, things we have to stretch and order, and we'll put them on days in the calendar. So there's like the daily things and like the pre-painting rituals. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, every day or every other day, I like force myself to hike because I don't think I don't have the same amount of energy. I love it yeah. in the mountains. Like there's, it's a really rich practice for me. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, the then there's what's great about being an artist. There's room to like. Yeah, there's always wiggle things, room. Yeah, there's wiggle room, so you can let like fun days with your friends if it's beautiful outside or mm -hmm. painting in the park or. You know, we can also allow for if you're really feeling jazzed up about a certain painting, you can push things to the next day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah, like, yeah. If the flow is going, if you're feeling it, just take advantage yeah. of it. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. always flexible. Yeah. yeah. But I think that, that we, that's important to lean on and, and even hammer on a little bit here. That's if you true. don't have a calendar and a, li a running list in your life, uh, no matter whether you make art or not, um, I mean, it's just meant everything to, and, and to, would you guys like i personally suggest like an actual physical calendar that you have to write on yeah i think that's you, like your own per some people would or a planner if you kind of feel special about having a little planner in your yeah. pocket mm -hmm. um Those are yeah it's like a tactile whatever gets you to do it like we yeah. kind of like having a big calendar on our refrigerator mm -hmm. um, and then we write in big letters i it's, i have to have a whole you know kind of spectrum like list of things like i i must be sharpie it's got to be this like recycled paper you know and then i like i make my list and then i squeak that sharpie across and all that tactile stuff is kind of like worked into like the pleasure of achieving goals mm -hmm. uh, it's hard to yeah. explain if you made me do it with a ballpoint pen <laughs> I, would, like, I would like yeah it. i don't really yeah. want to write the list but um <laughs> I, i've found all the little just because it's it's such a switch from when you're like a teenager mm -hmm. you know to like get your life in order mm -hmm. and and it took years for us to figure out like yeah we have to have these running lists yeah and and put them on the calendar and um I yeah i saw my art career you know dub double in its sustainability mm -hmm. um in tandem with the, not the quality of the work or, or it was the yeah. calendar man <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> you, you tend to like f float in chaos otherwise and maybe it, it really helps to have goals so you like you know how to direct your energy for that day exactly or else you're just like oh, i don't know and if you start what's thinking, most important right it, now yeah if you start thinking about all the things you have to do and long term short term today like things that happen that you didn't expect that are going to take two hours today mm -hmm. it it becomes like really heavy and daunting and mm -hmm. and running your own business it can just feel like yeah too much well yeah like the the calendar because you have these tasks it helps set your mind straight a little bit so yeah. then once you are creating you're freer to exactly. be present with that yeah. and you have long term and short term goals on there so you know you can plan out okay and you look at the calendar each day you only try to put like you know one big thing on there a day mm -hmm. and maybe a couple little things and then the rest of your day is to paint yeah. and do your job so that mm -hmm. you feel you are accomplishing things if you stick right. to it mm -hmm. all of your goals will be accomplished right yeah. and that's what's been amazing we don't even have to there's this mental Base it takes up if you're like I gotta remember to do right, that. Right. Yeah. Once you write it down, it just feels like a it's weight like, is oh, lifted okay. a little more. You don't have to remember. You can just look at the calendar. Just it's write like it there. Taken care of. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so that has helped us like, and taken a lot of weight off running our own business and all these different things and people and, um, especially when you're getting into the creative zone, the worst thing is to have like all of these things on your mind, all these right. tasks or a job you have to go do. That's Absolutely. the worst feeling, yeah. Yeah. So do you guys have uh, maybe like personal missions with your art and then um, a, a collective one, like between, you know, how you guys work together a lot? Does it all melt together? Or what are you guys trying to do with this damn thing? Yeah, what are you guys doing? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Morgan and I are kind of... One of the things that really brought us together, I might say, is like like we have the same double initials, right? I'm Randall Roberts. She's Morgan Montala, and we were like, oh, that's that's Nick, Mr. That's, Mr. That's cute, Ray Rao. Know? 
and then we were like, we we kind of saw Momo that if we were like in love with each other in front of everyone, that that would be nice for the world. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, and we yeah. were kind of aware of it. We when we were recording, when I was courting her. <laughs> oh, uh, an old fashioned courting. I was like, right? look, you know, if 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 we're if we're really in love like this, and we go and make these paintings in front of everyone, like that's. That's some hot damn inspiring <laughs> shit, and and it's real. And like, are you really in love with me? Because if you are, <laughs> we have this opportunity to yeah, I, stale bread. <laughs> yeah definitely stale bread. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we were a little a little bit aware of it. I was aware of it, and I and and you know, it was like, won't this be awesome? Like, let's become. In a very minor way, not it's not like our main thing, but we were like we're, we're aware of the spectacle of mm-hmm. this like a couple, and Morgan's adorable, and, and I knew the two of us being up there, people would go like, oh, I you know I, I want to sleep with that girl, <laughs> and the, and someone their friend would lean and go, no, that's Morgan and Randall, they're this like couple, and they go around making art, and aren't they <laughs> cute, and uh, is don't I want to treat my partner? Like in that. a way like that and make stuff together and and uh i don't know uh there's a little bit of our the public side of why we make art together right i mean you're looking at me so weird <laughs> <laughs> it, it's it's beautiful it's really cool yeah, yeah i mean yeah i've never heard it articulated quite like that but i would say yeah do you, you want to i'm in also some... in love with you Outside of that, yeah. <laughs> it's just for the public thing. Just for but the public. Just this to sh- they sleep in separate great beds. Great show. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know what our like our our goals are to keep doing what they're we're doing and hopefully find a way to make it more sustainable and really we get a lot of pleasure from <laughs> each other but also uh, the community yeah. the community that surrounds this and we'd love to like bring that together in a more solid way in some way with the art with you know right now we're kind of short term looking for just a little hub around Boulder Colorado where we can start to build a little foundation art spot for people to come hang take workshops do art shows and yeah and have a little bit of mountain paradise Mm -hmm. um but yeah i guess it is ultimately our paintings are meant to like spread love or the idea of working together and making something beautiful yeah yeah and your paintings together they always look to me like this like a celebration they look like the coziest paisley party you could ever think of you know it, it pulls you in and it's very positive and warm and loving maybe it's, you guys cool. should thank you thank you very much <laughs> <laughs> maybe you guys should should name your uh should name your painting duo cozy paisley you know <laughs> am i right we'll, we'll think about that andrew <laughs> Honey, will will you put that on the calendar to think about Andrew's idea? <laughs> okay, good. Cozy Paisley, bro. Come on. It's 420 in celebration of 420. I just want to say Cozy Paisley. All right? 420, 20, 20, 20, 20. <laughs> What about... Uh, 20, 20. <laughs> what about, um, you know, we we make psychedelic art. Like what role do um, psychedelics or psychedelic experiences play uh, mm. in your art? Well, in the words of our boy Terrence McKenna, um, I think if you go through this crazy ride, to paraphrase Terrence, uh, if you go through this thing called life without ever having tried psychedelics, it's as if you did the whole thing without having sex. without having sex. Yeah. It's that important and. Ah, <sighs> it, it's tricky because out of seven billion people, you know, it's not for everyone. Certainly not. So it has to find the right people. But when it does, then you, you, you. I mean, you weep, uh, that you had waited this long right. <laughs> to to experience this side of life. Um, 
and and when I set out to make paintings, you know, I was really into uh, I wanted to write a little bit, you know, and and Mark Twain, of course, I love Mark Twain, and I really vibed with his um, write what you know. So when I set out to make paintings, it was like, what's the most important thing I can make a painting about? And uh, I think psychedelics were, you know, when I scan my life, it's the most important thing I can think of to talk about. When you take the temperature of the rest of the world, that there's so many uh, squares <laughs> who, <laughs> who, you know, most people who've ever lived haven't tripped. Right. And I think, yeah, just right now at this curve of the human evolution, it's important for the right people uh, and as many people who can safely uh, journey on psychedelics as possible right. to maybe do that, to solve these g enormous problems. It wakes you up to like the real world in a lot of ways, in most cases. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know. There's a lot of, again, there's a lot of people who shouldn't take drugs because right. the chemistry is off or, or what have you. But Yeah, there's a huge difference between uh, psychedelics and a psychotic break. Just because they have the same prefix doesn't mean they're anywhere near uh, the same experience. Because, I mean, you can have a nervous breakdown, which I'm pretty sure I have had. <laughs> uh, in like my teens, you know, I was like angry, depressed, you know, you name it, all the, the weight of the world weighing down on someone who hasn't actually experienced any, uh, sort of hardship necessarily, but still it's, it's this psychological thing that weighs on you. And when you, when you have a psychedelic experience, typically 90% of the time, if your brain chemistry isn't off balance, you actually get better. Uh, but with a psychotic break, you're not like better afterwards, you know, I don't know that <laughs> just, a, yeah, I would, uh, I would agree to, with that statement. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we, we're preaching to the choir here, but well, I mean, no, yeah. maybe there'll be one person listening I, who's like, I don't know about these psychedelic things. Isn't it just like getting crazy? Okay. Well, if it, that person is listening, um, I forget the name of the study, but the, was it in, Oh, was it in Chicago where they gave Catholic monks uh, mushrooms? The Good Friday Experiment. Yeah, and uh, these were people who'd never um, experienced psychedelics at all. They were uh, they dedicated their lives to to God, and I think there was thirty of them around there. Uh, please look this up because uh, I. Where's where's Jamie? <laughs> um, look this up. Blair, pull it up. <laughs> no, but uh, so so anyway, if you're curious about psychedelics, check out the the monk, the Good Friday uh, experiment. These these monks who prayed every day and uh, had this connection to God, all well, not unanimously, but I, th I think it was a, a really high percentage, eighty or ninety percent of them experienced. Um, what they would call a true religious experience and uh they they felt like all the praying that they've been doing all along was uh uh completely uh what's the word <laughs> sorry it is uh, is trying to imitate that experience or something yeah they had a they had a, a, le a legitimate transcendent experience in from their perspective um and that's with all the trappings of religion laid on top of their brain yeah we're doing we're doing i'm doing this story no justice I <laughs> it's 420 bro <laughs> um but <laughs> as far as your question goes um i think oh, psychedelics have definitely been an influence on like well in randall's style and stuff too like it's definitely characterized as psychedelic but you do also have a lot of topics that are more um I don't know, go a little farther than that and then reach more beyond like just the topic of psychedelia. You know, it's definitely an influencer. And I think people think that we take drugs and sit in our studio and paint all fucked up. Yeah. And that's how we oh, come up with no. this stuff. And we hear it a lot like, oh, how high were you working you on that? Yeah. And I was like, actually, you'd be really bored with, with <laughs> yeah. probably our day to day life. Yeah. 
it's, it's not, not like, like that we use it, it yeah we use yeah. experiences to inform right like those experiences may have opened us up to ideas and and just ideals or symbols or all these other things that we then incorporate into our art so it's definitely something that i think we support as a like potential to open up and expand human connection with each other which is what we're do- trying to do with our art yeah mm-hmm. psychedelics kind of and 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 weed uh to some extent lead 420 420 um <laughs> they lead the user into retrospection which uncannily often turns towards something good isn't it strange Mm -hmm. that things like hiking and composting and recycling and all these things in the in the 70s were um hippie ideals and fringe Mm, yeah Yeah. now they're very mainstream so so you do this you do these things sorry and you have (laughs) they're very french yes these french experiences (laughs) (laughs) no but so so just the forced amount of introspection that mm-hmm. these things give you tend to turn you into like a nice person. Think of the yeah. stereotypical uh, hippie guy. Hey, man. Yeah. But take yeah. it easy, man. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. You see the interconnection mm-hmm. of all things and in these kind of, you know. I We do get this question a lot, particularly at uh, Electric Forest and festivals. It's like, how high were you when you made that? It's like, y- y- you, yeah, I was completely sober. You don't, you don't, you know, when you're done having a conversation on the phone, you hang up. Or when you're you're done cooking dinner, you don't leave the burner on. Because that's bad. I've done that by accident. I mean, we've times. all left the burner on metaphorically <laughs> and literally, but it, does, think, it doesn't make we, for good. Uh, uh, I think we can turn this interview around. <laughs> 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 let me just let me just get in and say no, no. The burner analogy was good. It was really good. <laughs> I'm I'm concerned about the listener. Listener. Did you want to hear Andrew's burner thing? Do you want to hear me talking right now? <laughs> no. No, you don't. <laughs> no, you do, though. And this is why. Yeah. For the following reasons. <laughs> Art is like a burner. <laughs> Meaning... <laughs> Normally, I would say it's not a microphone, but someone's just got to take that shit away. <laughs> yeah, we should remind you it's a special 420 episode. Yeah, it's a special 420. special 420 episode. I think we're making this in a way of just people that are like, you know, maybe fans of artwork and want to get to know who the artists are, just as people, aspiring artists, getting to hear artists maybe that they had. What are just some like easy, practical words of advice for people? I think you should find out or maybe try a variety of ways of making art Mm, mm -hmm. and see what you like the most or maybe set different days to practice different things. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, maybe one day you could sit and draw something as it is in front of you and do your best and learn how to learn that. If you just did that every day, you'd become a really amazing drawer after a year of it. Um, especially if you're drawing like the same thing or the same variety of things, like you can kind of hone in and figure out what you like to mm. draw or paint about or building stuff or just, I don't know, finding out what sets your creative fire mm-hmm. and doing little bits of it every day to yeah. like get better and feel more comfortable. And you can kind of start your path that way. Cause if you make art every day, you're like, okay, well here I am with, paintbrush and and paints and I don't know what to paint or I don't even know where to begin you know should I mush paint around but then you might not like it and and it's hard to just push yourself but I do like doing things and practices like drawing something as it really is every once in a while because it does help you kind of like sharpen your practice your you know hand-eye coordination your how you're viewing things from 3d to 2d Mm -hmm. um but yeah I think find out what you like. 
Yeah, I would I would say uh, also find your tribe. Um, mm, find yeah. a community. If you daydream about moving to San Francisco, uh, I don't know if you can live with yourself as a creative person. You know, you're stuck in Ohio or upstate New York, where I was from, or whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, going and finding community of motivated, smart, cute, fun people, all crushing their game. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that maybe you can draw good, and there, there's that you know big fish in the small pond thing. If you are from a small town. Or even you know if you're from whatever whatever your dream you know if if, if you if you're from Manhattan and you think uh, oh I'm gonna make it out to the log cabin and I'm gonna write my novel um, I think that's as crucial a move and then because then you throw yourself into the kiln and 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 fire who you're gonna be I don't know as far as surviving on painting specifically living in a big city with cool roommates who are also in a creative lifestyle is in my experience um th- like the most valuable move mm-hmm. that you can do you can always go back home with your b- with your tail between your legs mm-hmm. but um you go you move to brooklyn and you wash dishes and you live with six people and you're all making art and talking about art and there is this fever pitch beauty that comes out of these brief periods three or four years in that situation and you will you'll you'll cut your teeth and uh be ready for the road but you know who knows Uh, everyone's path is so different henry darger the janitor who made all he made uh i don't know hundreds of volumes of these books with this kind of alice in wonderland character all his life and then he died and they kind of went into his apartment after he he passed away and found out he'd been making some of the best American art uh, for the last 60 years with, without it, without any acknowledgement. So It's like, do you value a life of, uh, of creativity enough to, to sacrifice, to put the, to put the, uh, you know, whatever sacrificial offering on the altar, whether it's financial stability or whether or not you're going to be known you know, and I don't think that has to be the goal either. I think like you can also make art as your personal passion, that's and that can be fine. So, do you guys got any uh, crazy festival stories? That's that's something I like to ask. Not crazy, or just like memorable, epic. When I was at Camp Bisco with some of my best friends in two thousand and I want to say seven or eight. Uh, uh, I I uh, was really getting deep into psychedelics with this particular group of friends. Mm-hmm. So we were changing our lives, and and, right. and uh, Camp Bisco is kind of this like joke container, which is just a <laughs> melee of of you know at least back then Hell's Angels. Yeah, the Hell's Angels like ran the place, and uh, it was the only place you could catch it like a three-day dubstep set yeah on the east coast uh in 2008 anyway uh my one of my best friends andy milford uh, an amazing photographer he had this plastic goose from the 1970s on his porch and i was like i'm gonna we'd seen one or two rage sticks at yeah. last year's what event yeah. yeah yeah and we were like wouldn't it be neat if we had like one that lit up and was better than the underpants hanging off of the stick or the, <laughs> the, the flattened wine bag or whatever people had. <laughs> and so we, like, I, I rigged up all these lights and I drilled and made his porch goose, Lucy the goose, uh, mobile so that she flashed really brightly. Um, and I, I knew it would kind of look really cool in the crowd. Mm-hmm. And... So we went to Camp Bisco, and uh, we went really deep on on handfuls of psychedelics to catch the the, uh, the big bass nectar set. Mm-hmm. This is when bass nectar was really coming up. Yeah, and there's about ten thousand people at, at Camp Bisco, and you know we're at the campsite for sundown, and then we're we're kind of loading up. <laughs> 
And uh, once we got the goose together on this stick and I realized like how bright it was, I was like, oh, this is kind of a big deal. This is going to be a whole thing. And I'm with, you know, 12 of my best friends ever. And um, we're also having the most poignant spiritual experience of our lives to date um, because we were really loaded like Hunter Thompson loaded uh, for the first time. And um, Bisco draws kind of a rougher crowd. So, like, everyone else, you go with your friends to Camp Bisco, and then everyone else is cartoons. You don't have to, like, really (laughs) be, you don't have to acknowledge them much. They don't care about you. There's kindness and the occasional passing of a water bottle. But other than that, it's not the the lovey-dovey vibe of a Bisco. It's not a transformational vibe. Yeah, it's not transformational whatsoever. It's (laughs) barbed wire and dubstep. And so I go with this goose for the first time, and it's blinking really bright because I had this, like, camping headgear light hooked up in there, and um, it's like this row of LEDs. And I'm kind of losing faith in what we're doing. Uh, The idea was to, before Base Nectar started, plow through a crowd of 5,000 people and get dead center middle with this party of 10. Yeah, yeah. And... uh, we get to the kind of outside wall of the first, you know, and, and the, the sta- yeah, the stage thickness. is a quarter mile away, yeah, yeah, or what have you, you know. Mm-hmm. And we're like, okay, we gotta like take this bright goose on a stick <laughs> and like elbow our way through with this party of ten. And I, I, I'm in the front like an idiot, and I, I'm like, I you don't know, this- guys, like <laughs> this isn't gonna work, you know. Like I can't go up behind all these sweaty people and just say, excuse me, we have a goose. <laughs> <laughs> and this biker guy uh who's like hanging on the edge i imagine him with like a 40 in his hand <laughs> you know, I'm, but i'm not sure if he had that and he leans into me and he slaps this big meat ham hand on my back and he says you better work that goose motherfucker <laughs> 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 and and I, that was the gatekeeper. For right? me, that was like cold water on my face in, in round <laughs> 14, you know, and I was like, all right, that's right. I'm on this holy mission to bring my people down there, and we're going to get in the middle for base nectar. <laughs> and I said, I think I said thank you and hugged him. <laughs> and then he was we like, w- I didn't mean like that. <laughs> and then we went in, and uh, yeah, the, the sort of like strobe. Uh, experience down in there that was like going to church you know like like absolutely being down there and we were the only light up rage stick you know that rage sticks have since become yeah quite the thing <laughs> uh, but um i felt really proud i so proud that we made this one light up and that it was i want to go back really quick to andy's porch where this goose lived all the time yeah was the home of so many like countless um dinners and and just conversations over wine when the sun was going down andy's porch was the shit that's Mm. where everybody hung out so we brought this like gem of our fucking crew and we we completed our mission and i don't know if you haven't been there you don't know what i mean but but if you have you know how you get on these like crazy soul missions yeah and you're like and uh yeah i fucking cried with my friends and hugged them down there because (laughs) we we were hearing uh god the song uh uh, time stretch he dropped time stretch during that set and i I, who cares there was there's a reason he's such a big deal it was he was like being a pastor at church for a couple years there for like i think uh, like thousands of people like i was six to oh nine yeah yeah for sure it was like if you could make it down there but yeah all the stuff around it you have to like buy a festival ticket go super deep with your friends oh my god bass next is playing you gotta go down it's a whole ordeal i think it, it's not something that we do anymore like i don't care about bringing the goose to the main stage <laughs> right, anymore right. but i'm glad that was a real trial and tribulation and it was beautiful was the yeah. goose on your workbench the same one yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Cool. well now um no but uh andy has the original we've okay we send each other ebay links when one comes up and so he has i think three of them <laughs> oh, no he and the original and i have a, a 
a replica. It's the Gladys Goose company. They only were operating uh, from like 1973 <laughs> yeah. till like the early 80s. Uh-huh. And there's only so many of these plastic Gladys Goose lawn ornament nice. geese <laughs> out there. And, you know, it's like the little hipster pride on, on that collector's item. Right, right. Not everybody has the plastic goose. They don't make them anymore. But there's, I mean, there's something about having that item that you yourself have Im- imbibed or imbued with with meaning. You know, that's my crew, man. That goose is our our lady. That's your mascot. <laughs> yeah, for sure. The the evening's coming. We're winding down. Uh, how can people f- uh, follow you and you? if you don't already know? Um, yeah, morganmandala.com. We'll have all your information, shop, um, at Morgan Mandala. Is that what we say for Instagram handles? Yeah. 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 Um, and, yeah, um, you can find us through there and Randall's website, allofthisisforyou.com. We can both be contacted through there as well. Randall? No. <laughs> Other than I just want to say 420 plays it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and like, if you weren't here for it, then then maybe next year. Yeah, you know, plays it. It's still early yet. You maybe know, somewhere else, <laughs> champ. It's funny to note, I think, that Randall didn't smoke weed for I don't know what. Oh yeah, let's talk about that. Fifteen years. Yeah. I just think that's interesting and really cute <laughs> that you. <laughs> 420 plays in it today. Yeah. You really are getting on the medicinal tip with that, though, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, we can go there. I, I smoked weed like every day from, you know, 17 years old till uh, around 25. And then I, I yeah, I kind of like started tripping and taking care of myself more. And I just didn't want to like, I associated weed smoking with uh, daily video game playing. So mm. I was like, I don't want to play video games anymore. I don't want to be a lump, sit around the house and da da da. And, right. uh, that was like the old version. Um, but then I dealt with uh, like a, a tremendous amount of kind of midlife uh, depression and anxiety. And um, even somewhat recently, I've rediscovered the miracle of marijuana mm-hmm. for the straightforward cure that it has for me and maybe some people is when you're stoned and you're you're taking five minutes to figure out how to make your coffee at Seven Eleven, or you're trying to answer an email and you're like, what was I saying? That state, that confused kind of state that I was avoiding uh, is preferable to suicidal depression. Yeah. <laughs> or overwhelming so, anxiety. Or overwhelming anxiety. Mm-hmm. I, I, and and it, it, it's kind of awesome that uh, we live in a time where it's legal and a place where it's legal. Uh, because yeah, things were getting pretty dark there for me. And then I rediscovered Lady Mary Jane to make the days, uh, bearable. Do you think you need to go through a certain amount of, um, suffering to really appreciate things or? Sure. A certain amount. Right. Um, I was kind of like more than meeting my quota for depression (laughs) and, you know, I think everybody should have a blue day and kind of think, oh, God, you know, the coral reef in Australia is two-thirds gone. Like, really? Like, that's really kind of a bummer. And, like, get sad. Yeah. Because the other end of the the next day you get up, dust yourself off, and get to work. Right. There's a uh, more urgent depression, I think, where you're, like, thinking about killing yourself on a regular basis that isn't healthy. And anything... That you can get in there and shake shake that up with. Um, and it turns out for me, uh, marijuana is a really potent uh, method for getting in there. I didn't want to fuck with SSRIs and like get you know uh, or or expensive therapy. Right. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's it's hard to say. Everyone's like we're in such a new place as a society. Mm-hmm. There's yeah. so many there's so much mental illness uh and then the internet is thrumming along like a locomotive right and it's like it's clearly all tied together the the, you know over the top consumerism and all this stuff is we've never been here before so of course 
a lot of people are going to check out and uh, mentally and, right. and not be able to it's like handle. short circuits handle. too much to handle yeah the same thing happened to the poor guys who fought in world war ii in vietnam you know like, yeah yeah you're like this is there's too much going on i, I can't handle this and then you right. you survive the event and 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 the event for us is the world like the world at our fingertips yeah i too mean too much information the internet and global warming alone are like yeah enough to make anyone it would in that drive state. someone from the rococo period instantly <laughs> insane, insane yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah so so what do you do you know um yeah and yeah i don't like the medical options for placating the mind I, for the I you don't either want have to be Rich. I'm not trying to take some Xanax. Right. I'm not or, trying to take Zoloft. I'm not right. trying to, you know, do all that stuff. And then there's this legal weed. That's and, just at right there. Yeah. It's right and here. It, it's a strange substitute because it just makes everything kind of weird and funny for the day. <laughs> yeah. And you do, but... Uh, but you it, still feel everything fully. It's just like a, it's like a subtle perspective shift. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which mm -hmm. is just enough. Yeah. 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 Put the sunglasses on and you can see through the glare mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh that's kind of you know the miracle of of marijuana i think like yeah it's different for everyone and i think the perspective shift is a huge thing but it's also the difference for everyone is big like i it's kind of in my ritual when i won't smoke all day after i've exercised after i've done all my emails after i've done all my shipping after i've done all this like kind of yeah. tedious work i want to get done quick clean the house mm -hmm. and then in like the afternoon when i set my space to work and paint it's like the open flow paint time mm -hmm. yeah it's like the time to unwind and experiment and yeah yeah and let, think, let loose you know you gotta there's a time and a place for it yeah you know well and i think it's amazing how it can go from like randall mood stabilizing to me kind of like creative open flow also to like a huge relief for people who are in pain mm -hmm. it's a really like dynamic plan anyways 420 yeah 420 <laughs> blaze it. 420 <laughs> it happens to everyone and i think that's why it's worse is because people feel really alone or like embarrassed to talk about it because we have to all be positive we have to like yeah especially i don't know in our culture we seem to like shove that stuff down and hide it away from the public um no matter who you are mm -hmm. and that can make people feel really isolated even though that most people are probably feeling something like that yeah every once in a while you get a glimpse of it when mm -hmm. you might mention it but it's a really interesting and weird problem that i think is perpetuated by the internet and instagram and all the social media and and just kind of the separation and false connection that we have through that. Mm -hmm. Whatever you got to do, you know, if, if you feel, you know, if you got to go out there and, and pick up trash and that's what you feel like doing, like do it. <laughs> <laughs> go do you. Well, I guess we'll tie a bow well, on it there. Or if you need yeah. to take a nap, do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you guys for for. Um, Thank you guys so much. I hope we can do this again. This. Yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, after your big day. I I, I love you guys. Love I, you I too. Just want to say it. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you guys for listening uh, to the podcast. Uh, please click subscribe and leave us a good review if you like our. Uh, 420 ramblings bro <laughs> um and that'll wrap her up peace out have a wonderful day we, we love, love you. you peace thanks for listening to another episode of rcaf podcast for additional images and notes on this episode you can check out our website rcafpodcast.com and you can find me andrew norris at andrew dot norris dot arts on instagram and andrewnorrisarts.com is my website i also have links on my website to episodes as well as all my best paintings and you can find me john speaker my website is johnspeaker.com on instagram i'm at john speaker and on facebook john speaker art and we want to give a special thanks to blair speaker john's lovely wife and creative director of the podcast she also updates the website and does all the podcast notes. So thank you, Blair. 
And we'd also like to thank Tyler Billman. He created the music for this podcast. You can find Tyler on SoundCloud and Instagram. His name is Get Billsman. That's G E T B I L L S M A N. Thanks again for listening. Peace. Thank you. <laughs>